Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the final uh, lecture on Gaze, the Beggars of Error, where I'll be discussing the character of Polly. And in doing so, I will talk about also the other characters as well to a certain extent. Now, <clears throat> before I go into any of this discussion, just like to uh, put uh, this to Snigdha that uh, I will uh, answer your questions at the end of the uh, of the discussion. Although I would request you to reframe your second question, which is there on, in the chat box, because I'm not really understanding what you want to say. Right. <clears throat> now, um, if you take a look at uh, what we suggested, that Gay's Beggar's Opera was primarily intended as a satire. And uh, it was trying to show the endemic levels to which corruption had set into 18th century society in which within the mercantile world of beggar's opera, every character as it were is motivated by greed and self-interest. So in a certain sense, all of the characters in the beggar's opera are satiric to a certain degree, uh, in the sense that they uh, reflect certain concerns of, uh, uh, or a certain ways through which the dramatist highlights how every single, uh, sort of strata in society from Filch, the uh, absolutely servant, to uh, Makeith, Jenny Deaver, and the others who are part of the criminal classes. Then, of course, Peacham and Lockett, all of them are involved within the uh, syndicate of crime that is part and parcel of the beggar's opera. So the fine gentlemen of the road and the fine gentlemen are, as it were, on the same pedestal. And that's why beggars opera. So the beggar and the opera, the shock of, you know, the high and the low being brought together within one ambit of corruption is part and parcel of uh, the satiric the tradition of the beggars opera. Now, the problem lies with Polly, because Polly seems to be the only character in the play who is not motivated by this entire schema of greed and corruption and whose love for Makeith seems to be genuine. And uh, also, uh, therefore, Polly seems to be the only moral center of the text. To what extent is this a valid statement? Uh, what is or how is Gay presenting the character of Polly? This is what we will uh, take a look at in this particular discussion. So without further ado, let me uh, share my screen so that I can share a few points that have been made on the PowerPoint. <clears throat> right, I hope this is visible. <clears throat> also think of the philosophical traditions within which Guy was writing. If on one side you have Makeith, Peacham, Lockett, all subscribing to the Hobbesian philosophy, that human nature is essentially manu uh, sort of uh, motivated by <coughs> self-interest, and therefore the life of a uh, man is nasty, violent, brutish, and short. Then the other angle of the 18th century benevolence was being sort of argued, among others, by the Earl of Shaftesbury. Now, uh, in Characteristics, which was published in 1711, the Earl of Shaftesbury was suggesting that human beings were naturally benevolent because of their capacity to feel. So if one of the, uh, one of the traditions of philosophy in the 18th century was moving towards rationality, there was a definite countercurrent to it, which talked about man as essentially, or human nature as essentially benevolent because of its capacity to feel and therefore identify with others. Therefore, this was emotions with benevolence, right? So Shaftesbury, you know, attacked Hobbes's assessment and sort of refuted the ideas that man is interested solely in personal gain and argued that man is naturally good. So uh, Shaftesbury became one of the major philosophers who influenced to a large extent, you see, uh, the uh, the sentimental tradition of the 18th century, where, you know, very often 
the character who would be taken, like say, for example, in uh, in the tender husband or say uh, the man of feeling in Henry Mackenzie, for example, would be slightly marginalized, but he would be able to feel and empathize with the suffering of all other persons, especially if you want to sort of take a look at this tradition and how it was fictionally developed. Take a look at Henry Mackenzie's Man of Feeling, which was almost contemporary with Fielding. So the Shaftesbarian ethic suggested, of course, that human nature was cap capable of feeling and therefore not in conflict. And therefore, human nature would naturally tend to associate, sort of empathize, and therefore help other beings. So it was a more of a sociable philosophy that uh, Shaftesbury was trying to inculcate. Now, Polly seems to be derived from this uh, tradition. Of course, Polly is also derived from uh, the slightly older tradition of the Romance, where the, there is an un, sort of unquestioned uh, love on behalf of the woman for her man. Now, uh, let me just quickly go on to uh, sharing probably a part of the text of Polly where I uh, am trying to make this point. This is once uh, when, you know, Peachum and Miss, uh, Mrs. Peachum have suggested that he re Polly reports Makith and they collect the reward. Polly says, now I'm rich indeed. He thinks I see him already in court. And uh, he says, what then will become of Polly? As yet I may inform him of their design and aid him in his escape, it shall be so. But then he flies, absents himself, and I bar myself from his dear, dear conver conversation. That too will distract me. If he keep out of my, the way, my papa and mama may in time relent and we may be happy. So Polly is, you know, unlike, uh, say, Lucy or Makith or the other characters, Polly is forever trying to think of Makith and the way in which uh, happy domestication may be, may be created. And therefore, you know, one of the most tender scenes of the text, as you've seen in, in the screenings that we've done, uh, you know, is uh, talks about the constant heart without disguise, heaving sighs, doting eyes, my constant heart discover, fondly let me loll. But Polly too is not unintelligent. You see, she realizes that, you know, Makith might be a false hero. And therefore she asks, and are you as fond as ever, my dear? So, you know, are you as constant as I am? And Makith is, of course, the great hypocrite who uh, suggests suspect my honor, my courage, suspect anything but my love, and so on and so forth. So in that sense, you know, Polly, because of her innocence, is also somewhere conned by Makith. You know, she's fooled by Makith into believing that she's her, his only love and his to-be wife. Of course, Lucy, on the other hand, will also be fo fooled by uh, Makith, as will four other women who will arrive with the child. So, uh, you know, it's only in these scenes between Makith and Polly Therefore, that a kind of a pastoral world of pure romance is created in the text. So, when I, where I sold on Indian soil, soon as burning day was closed, I could mock the sultry toil when on my charmer's breast reposed. So, it's a, it's a kind of idyllic, you know, sort of vision of a love truly fulfilled and a pure world of domesticity, which is in many ways at odds with the kind of, you know, macabre, almost grotesque world of self-interest that uh, the beggar's opera actually sort of dramatizes. Now, uh, therefore, it seems to me that Polly is marked by uh, a sense of love, a sense of devotion, a sense of, uh, let us put it, constance, uh, a sense of feeling for Makith, a total you know, empathization with Makith's condition, to which, of course, Makith responds by betraying her. Now, some of you might actually ask me one question. You see, Lucy too, 
in her own way loves Makit and allows him to escape. Right. So she she is the one who steals the keys from Lockett and uh, helps Makit to escape. So uh, why am I not saying that Lucy is a moral center too and that the love interest of Lucy is equally strong as Polly's? In fact, uh, there is this scene where Lucy and Polly both spar with each other. <laughs> now, the problem here is that in her love for Makit, Lucy is not averse to poisoning Polly. In fact, she mixes the poison with the glass of wine that she brings for Lucy uh, for Polly and asks her repeatedly to take it. Now, of course, uh, Polly uh, refuses and the glass is broken. But you see, Lucy's love is so self-oriented and so violent that in this love, she will willingly see Makith die or hang rather than let him stay with anybody else. And secondly, within this love, she's so violently inclined that she is not averse to poisoning and killing her competitor in love as well. So Lucy's love is not a Shaftesbarian love in that sense. Not Her character is not Shaftesbarian in the sense that she's not motivated by feeling, but her love is also tied with a certain sense of possession. And therefore, this love seems to be quite different from Polly's love. Right. So that is why I'm not bringing Polly and Lucy in the, on the same plane. Uh, Polly seems to be you know, a, a, a more elevated kind of a being, one whose moral uh, boundaries are uh, restricted and who, who sort of operates within the more conventional idea of romance and morality, right? So uh, one might argue that within the world of Makith, uh, who is blatantly betraying her and completely taking the woman as a kind of a commodity and a mode of pleasure, her father, who sees, you know, the daughter who can be widowed uh, if money can be got, the father and the mother. So uh, Polly is, you know, almost opposite, opposed to all these systems, all these characters who uh, treat, you know, human relationships in terms of the money that they can generate. So Polly has fallen in love with Mankit, knowing well that he's a pirate or he's a uh, uh, sort of highwayman, and he keeps she keeps the faith, as it were, in in the text. Now this happens also in the sequel. In fact, the importance of Polly can be seen in the sequel that he wrote. Unfortunately, the sequel was published but never performed because the satire irked uh, Walpole so much that he sort of asked the Lord Chamberlain to. Uh, ban this play to censor this and therefore you know uh, the play was performed only in 1753 long after Gay had died. So the only character that or rather the play's title Polly because you know Makith has now fled after his pardon to the Caribbean islands where he's become a pirate and he's again engaging in his ways of womanizing and Polly goes after Makith. And, uh, you know, Polly is sold into, uh, as it were, prostitution and she refuses, uh, saying that I might have been engaged with low life, but I'm not uh, a prostitute in any sense of the term. And uh, she she's faithful to Makith until she's again betrayed. She puts on the disguise of a man and stays in, the, in a household, almost slaving herself. And then finally, she, uh, when... <clears throat> The pirates are all sort of apprehended and Makith is hanged. She goes and lives with the Indians who, uh, res who res represent a different kind of a moral ethic altogether as opposed to the, uh, to the extremely greedy and rapacious Europeans. So the fact that Gay was writing a sequel on Polly and the fact that Polly was being sort of... Uh, written there as a moral center would suggest, you know, Gay's interpretation of Polly in the Beggar's Opera as well. 
But there are a few problems here, and I would like to raise those problems too. Uh, what are the problems with uh, with poly? Now, I will come back to uh, uh, the the, uh, the Hogarth's representation of poly later on, but there is one segment in the play which has actually led critics to suggest that poly is also part and parcel of the world of deception in the beggar's opera, right? Uh, in act one, she says, when she's talking to her father about Makith, he says, I know as well as any of the fine ladies how to make the most of myself and of my man too. A woman knows how to be mercenary, though she hath never been in a court or an assembly. We have it in our natures, Papa. If I allow Mac Captain Makith some trifling liberties, I have this watch and other visible marks of his favor to show for it. A girl who cannot grant some things and refuse what is most material will make but a poor hand of her beauty and soon be thrown upon the common. Now, this has led William Emson, of, of, of the major critic of uh, the Beggar's Opera, to suggest that uh, Polly is actually making a false fine lady claim and has real shopkeeper vices and uh, is also followed by Donaldson when he concurs and says that Polly is getting what she can out of her husband in order to line her own pockets. So in their view, you know, Polly is as much a part of uh, the greedy Hobbesian ethic of beggars opera as the rest of the characters. She's only faking uh, a kind of uh, rhetoric of virtue and uh, therefore she's deceiving both Makith and her father and that Polly need not be taken as the moral center of the poem as well at all. In fact, uh, Ensign suggests that there's a, the irony is a little subtle, but uh, Polly is uh, equally culpable in the beggar's opera. Now, one might just say that, uh, you know, and that has been argued that, you know, Polly says this because Polly is quite intelligent. She says this to stave off her father and wants Makith at the right time so that Makith can flee. If she was indeed, you know, looking for Makith's death, she would not have allowed Makith to fly or to escape. So these are the two opinions on Polly, really. One argues that Polly is the moral center of the poem. The other argues that Polly is uh, a slightly deceiving kind of a woman who is as much part of the world of uh, the beggar's opera as the rest of the characters you have to make your own judgment but you know there are certain critical sort of parameters which we should also look at you know the first being that you know all the other 18th century critics saw polly as a kind of a moral center you know uh, in in the sense that polly is in the first reviewers a young innocent girl made of nothing but simplicity and nature very fond and tender. Whether the appearance of the first folly made and the manner in which uh, she played the part conveyed this idea of uh, the innocence in Polly and stamped her character on her. So uh, even the first critics of the Beggar's Opera noted how Polly was indeed a virtuous char character. Now, this is also seen in many ways in the interpretation that uh, that. Hogarth made of Polly, and this is something which I want you to take a look at the painting right now, because this painting is very significant. You can see the kind of world of uh, Newgate that is created in the background through the sets, uh, the dark uh, uh, sort of sort of railings and cells, as it were. You can see Makith there standing with his red claret coat, symbol of, you know, <clears throat> extreme uh, uh, sort of uh, libido and <clears throat> uh, flamboyance. You can see Lucy here in blue kneeling before Locket. But the center of the, of the, of the painting and the person who's most visible, even in black and white, is with her white innocent gown, uh, Polly kneeling before her father Peacham in order to 
give Makhit a reprieve. Right. So, you know, Hogarth was also interpreting, in that sense, Polly as somebody who is marked by purity, somebody who's marked by innocence, and somebody who is different from the garish uh, sort of a moral code of, uh, of the beggar's opera. So, Hogarth's painting, <clears throat> because they provide a contemporary representation of the play as it was originally staged. So, the first painting was done early in 1728 for John Rich. And in all these versions, Polly's figure is fully illuminated and draws the eye immediately. Even in black and white reproduction, she is distinguished from the other characters by special uh, brightness. But in the painting's original colors, the purity and radiance of Polly's white satin provide a distinct contrast to the other figures. Lucy is dressed in green, Peacham in black, Makith in scarlet. Whatever the significance of these colors, you know, Polly's unique status in the group is indisputable. As Pierce notes, it was a stroke of art to suggest innocence in the midst of vice and immorality. So, all through, you know, uh, the 18th century, the interpretations of Polly suggested that she was a figure of purity, innocence, love, romance, so on, as opposed to the uh, dubious moral center of the beggar's opera. Now, this is the first reason that we say that Polly is indeed the moral center. Second is that uh, Gay decided to write a sequel on Polly. And within this sequel, Polly is presented as the only virtuous character, unlike the Europeans. And she finally sides and marries the Indians uh, in, the, in the text. Uh, now, the importance of the sequel might be noted in the sense that in the preface to, the, uh, to Polly, the sequel, uh, Gay states, that I know I have been unjustly accused of having given up my moral for a joke, like a fine gentleman in conversation. But whatever be the event now, I will not so much as seem to give up my moral. So Polly seems to be a moral qualifier for the beggar's opera. So the text Polly, as it were. And in this play, Polly's presentation seems to be, you know, indicating that she is indeed moral. Now... <clears throat> You see, this is, you know, Mrs. Trapes in Polly suggesting to her that she take on the role of a prostitute. And she says, pardon me, madam, you mistake me. Though I was educated among the most profligate in low life, I have never engaged in my father's affairs as a thief or a thief catcher, for indeed I abhorred his profession. So in many ways, Gay is probably answering this question about Polly's duplicity in the sequel. <laughs> In, in Polly, the text and his comments or his presentation of Polly in this sequel seems to suggest that Polly is indeed different from the uh, other moral, uh, immoral characters of the beggar's opera. Now, by therefore, by carefully linking the beggar's opera and Polly in these scenes, where Polly's virtue and sincerity are tested and proven, Gay seems to be forestalling the kind of criticism that, you know, Polly is indeed dubious, Polly is not moral, she is uh, deceptive, that would be made 200 years later. So reading Polly against the beggar's opera clarifies Polly's original position in both dramas and suggests functions and motivations for the heroine of the beggar's opera are opposed to the Hobbesian self-interest. Emson and his followers who unanimously dismissed the sequel have assigned her. Now, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, the play failed. Polly the play. You know, Beggar's Opera was phenomenally successful. But Polly, actually, uh, when it was even published, it did not actually sort of uh, succeed. Now, why didn't it succeed? The Patricia Mayer Speck, Specks has a very interesting argument. He suggests, she suggests rather, that the Beggar's Opera succeeded because it showed how pervasive the corrupt world of the beggar's opera was in the sense that every single character was motivated by this same kind of interest. So it conflated the high and the low, the political and the criminal, 
the aristocrat and the low life and therefore this kind of you know bantering and showing uh, and the satire made the beggars opera far more uh, potent and therefore powerful and she suggests that this ironic perspective where you know every character is shown to be similar lacked in poly where you know there is a clear demarcation between good and evil between the pirates and the europeans and the indians and the po and poly which therefore makes it slightly more you know banal in certain ways slightly uh, hackneyed and therefore poly uh, failed you know therefore uh, um, spack says uh, in poly society splits into heroes and villains there's no doubt at all where one's sympathies are to lie and therefore the Polly lacked the ironic perspective throughout and can be seen essentially as frivolous and meaningless. There's no use flogging a dead horse, Spax writes, and Polly is a very dead horse indeed. So what I'm trying to suggest is that, you know, Polly remains one of the major characters of the beggar's opera. Her character is marked by a constance, constancy kind of faithfulness, uh, uh, a refusal to engage within the moral, uh, within the activities of Peacham. And therefore, she remains the Shaftesburian binary to the Hobbesian world of the beggar's opera, where all other characters are motivated by self-interest. Her love for Mekhip is seen as something which is enduring and selfless, contrasted with Lucy's love, where love is a possession for which Lucy is willing to kill. <coughs> this interpretation of Polly <coughs> is challenged by one of the dialogues within the text where Polly seems to be suggesting that she's deceiving Mekhith and is as corrupt as the others. But one must note that Polly is very intelligent. Now she sort of, uh, for the sake of Mekith, she is manipulating her father. And she refuses also <clears throat> to drink the cordial that Lucy offers because she strongly suspects Lucy's <coughs> uh, sort of, uh, let us put it this way, Lucy's uh, Lucy's motives and she, she rightly guesses that Lucy is up to no good. She wants to poison her. So Polly, even though she is faithful, romantic, Polly is equally intelligent and she has this judgment. The only point where she fails is that she's massively sort of deceived by <clears throat> Makith and his uh, sort of amorous inclination. So in that way, she's also a victim. She is also a victim in the sense that she is victimized by the person whom she loves. She is also equally victimized by her parents who want her widowed so that she can come into some money. So within the world of the beggar's opera, Polly seems to be a binary, a Shaftesburian figure who empathizes with Mekith, who swears undying love. And this in sort of this interpretation <clears throat> is strongly, you know, recurrent in the 18th century interpretations of that character, especially in Hogarth's painting of the Beggar's Opera. This is also strengthened by the fact that Polly becomes the center in a sequel, which is named after her where Polly is seen to be the moral character who refuses prostitution, who is willing to follow his, her beloved into the Caribbean, who willingly takes up almost slavery and servanthood for him, who is betrayed once again, and who finally sides with the innocent Indians rather than the rapacious pirates and the Europeans. Therefore, Polly 
within the beggar's opera, that is my argument, seems to be uh, correctly differentiated from all the other characters. And she remains, you know, the only moral center of the text. So that is all that I had to say about Polly. Now, I, I will just briefly talk about uh, mm, uh, a few questions that Snigdha has uh, sort of put for me. Snigdha has asked the lack of the society that the satirist shows to us would ultimately be resolved or be as it was. Look, you know, poetry, satire seeks to hold up a mirror to society. And therefore, it's not that po so poetry can make something happen, but as you point out, something interesting did happen. First and foremost, you see, all these satires against patronage, for example, led to the system, abolition of the system of patronage, really. So literature did contribute to the erasure of one system. Secondly, and to answer your question more urgently, you know, throughout the 18th century, people like Gay, Fielding, Swift were all arguing against the bloody code and arguing for the reformation of the penal code. And in 1765, the penal code was indeed changed and the bloody code was replaced with a much milder code which emphasized reformation rather than punishment. So yes, in that sense, Nigdha, with, your, with reference to your question, literature did indeed make play an important part along with, of course, you know, political and other kinds of pressure to bring about a change in society. Now, did it bring about a change in the Hobbesian nature of society? One hardly thinks so, given the trajectory of human beings from the 18th century to our times too. We've been as Machetian as uh, uh, the 18th century ever was. So it br did bring about certain kinds of change in society. Uh, of course, the Shaftesburyan idea of emotionality actually died out, you know, because uh, it was seen as far more, uh, you know, uh, let's put it way, naive in a brutally political economic society. Uh, the Shaftesburyan idea that man was naturally good and he would create a kind of community of similarly empathizing characters actually did not hold much longer. Although, uh, you know, one of these, uh, this tradition moved through Hume and then through uh, Adam Smith, but this gradually sort of died away. Right. The um, other question that you ask is laughter, the way of correcting distortion, what respect is it different from satire? Now, you see, laughter is present in both comedy and satire. Now, and satire is not just one satire. It's not just a you know, homogeneous form in that sense. As you remember, many of my uh, lectures have talked about the various kinds of Horatian satire, Juvenalian satire. Now, you, could, you can have laughter in various ways. For example, you can have laughter in the crudest form of way, for example, through farce. So if you put a, a, a donkey's head on a man and make him dance, that is the crudest form of laughter, which laughter is just physical in nature. You can equally have a kind of a Saturnalian kind of a laughter where, say, for example, through the character of Falstaff, through the characters of Toby Belch and uh, Feste in uh, Twelfth Night, you have a more Saturnalian kind of a laughter which uh, is uh, largely intended to purge. And the third kind of laughter is a more critical laughter that kind uh, happens in comedy where the laughter is intended at somebody. This is the humorous comedy or the kind of uh, typed comedy where the laughter has a social function, as Bergson says, that laughter is a gesture that society is making against somebody, showing him that he is inadequate, he or she is inadequate, and therefore trying to uh, <coughs> correct them. So laughter in this sense is a social gesture and a corrective medium. So this can be, you know, uh, light, it can be brutal. So and very often, this corrective function of laughter is the one which is 
associated with the medium of satire. And these are the two versions of laughter that satire offers. The Horatian version, which is milder, and the Juvenalian version, which is very harsh. You can also have the kind of black humor, laughter, which is tinged with tragedy, for example, uh, in Hamlet, say, for example, or in the revenge tragedies, where the ironies release much of the black humor of the uh, of mm, the plays. So uh, we do sort of uh, see that laughter and comedy, comedy is comedies can equally be satiric and satire can equally be comic, but both of them use laughter as a kind of a medium to achieve its goal of correction. Right. Uh, in the modern era, do we take satire as a writing form? Of course, satire has been a very important, very important satiric form. If you are reading Bangla literature, for example, Nabarun Bhattacharya's uh, The Fataru stories, for example, would be a very pungent satire on the contemporary scenario in Bengal and so on and so forth. So there, uh, satire as a medium is, is present in, you know, almost all ages. Now, the only thing is purely satire probably uh, does not operate in the, uh, in the modern era. Of course, the visual and the satiric in the cartoon makes its appearance. You can see the satire within the uh, fictions, the magic realist fictions as well. Uh, in, say, for example, Salman Rushdie, you actually have a lot of satire being used. So, I would suggest that the satiric mood remains a very powerful mood, although, you know, verse satire or purely prose satire in the way that, you know, Gulliver's Travels is being written or, say, Epistle to Arbuthnot is being written is probably not present. But satiric comedies, satiric prose, satiric novels, satire in cartoons, satires in uh, cinematic versions, of course, are present throughout. Right. I hope I have answered your question, Snigda. Right. As for the rest, you know, it's been a pleasure being with you with the Beggar's Opera. I would just like to conclude by saying that in 1728, a play was performed which actually broke form. You know, it broke form because the society that it saw was like no other. You know, uh, mercantilism, money interests, self-interests, kind of taking over all human endeavor, cutting across classes, bringing everybody, as it were, within the same plane. And therefore, to sort of represent this, gay required a different kind of a form. And that form, as that form, he chose the ballad opera. He was also being sort of influenced by the cultural form of the opera, which was sweeping England. And he wanted to satirize this form also. So music and theater was brought together within the, within the broader framework of satire to write a text that would be a satire against the corruption of the Walpole government on the one hand, identifying it with the criminality of society on the other hand, and thirdly, showing an endemic human condition of self-interest on the other. So Gay's text is dated with, as far as the satire on Walpole is concerned. But as I pointed out, it has been reinterpreted, reperformed, and rewritten in different ages, namely by Bertolt Brecht and also by Ajitesh Bandhupadhyay and Ping Poshar Pala. And it remains a kind of an enduring commentary on the human condition in, a so in societies where, you know, human uh, where uh, interests in money and the self have taken over. It is thus that we can say that Gay's text actually speaks to us as contemporary, contemporary uh, figures. Right. So with that, I bring this discussion to an end with the Beggar's Opera, uh, with the master's degree students of mine. This has been a journey through uh, numerous texts through uh, Tristram Shandy, through Tom Jones, through Epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot, and through the Beggar's Opera. 
What remains then for us is to discuss a few background issues. And this we will take up in three separate background lectures once your internals are over. Right. So all the best with the midterm midterm internal assessment. And for those of you who are watching this beyond the syllabus of Bishop Bharati, thank you for being with us and encouraging us in this study of this fascinating text, the Gaze Beggars Opera and the journey through the literature of the Enlightenment. Have a good day and thank you, ladies and gentlemen.